Hey, thank you for being on the podcast with me, the Fox Den Angry. It is nice to meet you in person. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, Angry Pauline. So is your name German in origin? Yes, it is very German, and I speak German, so yeah. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Woman of talent here. So talk to me about, and for the listeners, you run an awesome account here at Angry Pauline, which it's awesome that your name was actually available like that. How about that? There aren't a whole lot of Ingrids. There are a lot of Ingrids, but... Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I actually, my name, my birth name is Ingrid, uh, but in Norwegian, we say Ingri. So my whole side of, my whole like mom's side of my family says Ingri. And then when I lived in uh, Germany for a while, they started saying my name Ingrid. And I'm like, that is definitely not my name. So <laughs> Ooh, got some harshness to it. <laughs> yeah, so I just, I was just like working on the phonetic route and I just dropped the D and then uh I was uh, modeling when I was in my early 20s for a while, and it was, like, exotic, so um, I kept it. <laughs> <laughs> exotic, that's great. How's the modeling industry? Um, awful, as usual. Um, that's good. Model- yeah, <laughs> it's, at least it's consistent. Um, I don't model anymore. It was just never um, – I, I was born and raised in L.A., and I was told I should model a lot, um, but I – You know, I really liked modeling, but I do not like the people that are typically in the industry and the way that they treat models. So, and plus I was just sort of born to be, I was born and raised like with the notion that like pretty's great, but it doesn't count for shit and you need to do something of value in the world. So. Wow. That's That's a great (laughs) worldview about contribution. That's, that's great. So Mm -hmm. you got, you felt like it was a meat market and you wanted to move into something substantial. Yeah, I mean, I knew it was a meat market, but I was like, you know, I like made some money. It helped me pay for school. And uh, it, I mean, it didn't get me all the way through school, but like, I mean, it was, it was what it was. And I'm not sad that I'm not in it, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. Um, what inspired, first of all, so uh, USN, talk about that. You're a USN vet. Oh, yeah. I was in the United States Navy. I was in for two and a half years. I unfortunately was discharged because of a medical issue. Uh, But um, yeah, I was super heartbroken when it happened because um, I was in the United States Naval Special Operations Unit. I was a first air crew and then I went over to EOD, which is explosive ordnance disposal. So I was... Um, yeah, just bomb squad. (laughs) Um, so I was training to like dive and dismantle bombs underwater and all this stuff. And it was, um, freaking awesome. And I just say, I mean, people like thank me for my service, but you know what? Like I was like, I mean, I never went to war because I got out early and, um, I just was kind of like in military Disneyland the whole time, like just in training and doing all these wonderful things where the conditions are still fairly safe. And I just got to train with some really like really wonderful men and meet some and like learn some really good things about myself and some good things about men and about uh, honor, courage, and commitment. And I'm eternally grateful to that time that I had in the United States military. That's spectacular. Honor, courage, commitment. So that really formed your ethos, we could say, toward exercise work and nutrition as well. Like j- just the, yeah. Yeah, it definitely solidified it. Um, uh, because like my strength saved people. Like that was the whole point of like me being strong and capable um, in the United States Navy, the rescue swimmers, they have this saying that of ourselves we give so others may live. And yes. I, that's how I live. Like that is absolutely how I live my life. And still to this day, although I'm not actively serving, like um, I believe in like uh, being physically strong and capable because I know not everybody can be. Uh, and like being brave because I know that uh, I will be able to help somebody somewhere along. Or I want to be able to help somebody so like, I mean, even small things like keeping up my AP, like AED CPR thing and, you know, just making sure that I like know how to dress wounds because like I've helped people in peril before, like a civilian and non-civilian world. So it's like, I don't know, it's just important and it's important for me to maintain this body and use it to help others and uh, use it to do work. <laughs> wow. That we're already off to a pretty heavy uh 
emotionally relevant start here. That's great. Did working with the bomb squad prepare you for diffusing the <laughs> proverbial landmine of Twitter? Because it's a it's a mess. So- oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so crazy out there. Um and it's, up. Yeah, it is. But um, you know, I actually there's this guy, Ed Lamore. Uh, Ed Lat- are you talking about Ed Lattimore? Yeah, Ed Lattimore. Yeah, he's so great. He like wrote this. I totally bought his uh after a while I totally bought his like uh, uh his Twitter course engagement is the new cocaine. And he was just like, he kind of like has a section about who to engage with and who not to. And so okay. there's a whole bunch of people out there that like, you just learn not to engagement with like, dude, they have like under a hundred followers and they're like just spewing garbage on their page. Like don't engage with them. They're just professional trolls. Like they're professional grumpy people. So like, don't get in that mess. But um, there are some people who are legitimate that just have like a whole wrath of stuff to say. Uh, when I kind of give the formula about what I've learned in order how to be happy, healthy, healthy, happy, and free. So yeah, never well, that'd be so controversial. <laughs> what? You never, you would never know that that would be so controversial. What health? Yeah. Trying to be healthy, happy, and free. Sure. Well, I think it, part of it is body positivity. I am, I am for, I think oh, it's yeah. important that people accept themselves where they are always. And I think that there have been messages people have internalized, maybe that they're worthless unless they have a perfect body. And you're just trying to help people to take ownership of their health because you know that exercise can help with depression, which there are studies that show that. I know that in my field. Now, it's not Mm -hmm. a cure-all for for, um, chemical imbalances and from severe, severe depression that are also that may be somewhat biological, but we know it's just undisputed fact that it does help move along with volunteering things like that, that just continually show up in the research replicable effects of exercise volunteering on depression. Right. And so that's a part of why I want to interview you is because you, I mean, in your pinned tweet, which is kind of controversial, but um, you talk about women who own their health don't suffer from depression. Well, I think, that's that's a good Twitter soundbite. I get it. I think mm-hmm. be no exercise does help with depression. I'll just say that. Anything mm-hmm. else extrapolated is whatever. Um, I don't own that. But talk to me about any experiences you've had, maybe hearing from people that you've worked with, or any any firsthand experience with physical health and mental health, and the the link between them. Oh, firsthand experience. Let's just start with there. <laughs> if you want, I always open yeah. it up. And if you don't want, you don't have. <laughs> yeah. So it's not something that I often talk about, although I do think it's important. And I just don't talk about it because I'm not super proud of myself, uh, my actions in the past. But um, <laughs> also, if the United States Navy knew it before I went in, I would have been disqualified. But I was a heavy drug user for four years when I was in a, um, when I was in my in my teens. Um, like 16 to 19 or 15 to 19. And, um, and I'm not talking about like, I like drank and smoke weed. It was like speed cocaine and heroin. And I was a heavy user and, um, and I got sober. I got arrested. I didn't get arrested. I got rescued and I got sober. And, um, the one thing that kept me that I think the only reason why I ever like clung to my, myself and like really like had a grasp on my own soul was because, um, I was exercise. I managed to even through my addiction run once a week, every Sunday, I ran for like a mile or two. Right. <laughs> I, I like, don't, yeah, I don't know. I'm just like, Oh, like <laughs> hi and running down the street and like all like 115 pounds of me. And I'm five, I'm like almost five, nine. So it's like, I, that was very, that was very skinny. And I would come and I'd been like a, an athlete. I had been a water polo player before that. So, um, I was always a very sensitive. So I was always a very sensitive person. Right. Uh, yeah. But so I used drugs. I got, I went to rehab, got sober. Um, and I was sober for a couple of months before I went into the military. Um, and it was because I managed to run through my addiction that I think I never truly lost myself. And then it was because I threw myself into weightlifting and I threw myself into exercise and something that was extremely physically demanding, but also had a purpose that was beyond just me that I was able to stay, uh, that I was able to be happy and healthy. And I wasn't happy and healthy 
for a long time. And like, since then, I, I mean, I got sober in 2006, so it's been a while. Sure. So, um, but like, even then, like, um, like even in the past years, like I've struggled from like depression and isolation and like depressive thoughts. But like, I just reminded myself that I made a choice to be happy and that yeah. I was going to do whatever it took in order to stay alive. And like, the part of that is like eating healthy and exercising. And by now, like exercising is just part of my personality. And it's sure. something that I need to do in order to be a functioning member of society. Right. So, Shoot. yeah. <laughs> that is, so you have some amazing, amazing lived experience. And so I, I love that when I talk to guests and they're not just spouting platitudes, right? They're not saying things that they haven't practiced. So mm -hmm. you encourage fitness because it helped you, like you said, retain that connection to yourself. And when you got clean of substances, the endorphins and the, the physical activity served as a real counter to, to getting back into addiction. That's, that, that's really powerful. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, it would work. It worked its power on me. That's for sure. Right. And um, I, I remember one time I read that um, the blend of endorphins that's released in your body as you work out is like the exact same blend that's released in heroin and opium. And I was like, well, that makes sense. Wow. <laughs> like, yeah, I I'm just going to, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know how true it is, but I mean, from what I know about physiology, it's pretty, it's pretty similar so, um, so I'm just going to keep sticking with it and it's just, yeah. And it's kept me, you know, and then after that, even beyond that, like, um, I've always wanted to live abroad and like do business abroad. And the fact that, um, I have this background that like my trade is weightlifting and like my talent is spotting movement, and movement patterns. And like my gift is teaching. Like yeah. I have taught in India. I've taught in Germany. I've taught in Oslo, Norway. I've taught in Vegas. I've taught in Los Angeles. So like, this is like, this on another level has like brought, like, am I making much money? No, but I'm traveling and I'm like, I'm teaching people all over the world. And I was able to live in Berlin for four years because I was a weightlifter. Like, nice. yeah, it was really cool. That's pretty impressive. Where was your favorite place that you've traveled? Oh man. Or even top places. I mean, Berlin. Okay. I love Norway. I absolutely love Norway, but I was like, I'm completely brainwashed because I was like grew up on a healthy dose of North mythology. And my, 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 uh, grandpa was an engineer who immigrated from Norway when he was, uh, in his twenties. And, and so he, we always, when I was very young, my mom says that I, uh, <laughs> I looked at a map and somebody pointed to Norway and I was like, no, 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 there's no way that's Norway. And I pointed to Russia. I was like, this is Norway because somebody, everybody had been in my family. They were like all Norwegian. They came and visited us because we were the family in LA and like, they were talking wonderful things about Norway. So I was like, Oh, it must be a huge country. <laughs> like, yeah. But, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. So I think That's Norway, yeah. yeah, Norway is a wonderful place to visit. And then if you really like going to cities, I think Berlin is a fantastic city. It is so great. What yeah. do you think about Vegas? Oh, Vegas is really good. So I'm, um, yeah, I currently live in LA. I will be moving to Vegas in September. Um, it's me and my boyfriend and I actually convinced him to live, move here. My parents live out here and we've come off, out quite often and hung out with them. Um, so we don't do this strip. We like go to like downtown Vegas and we go rock climbing and we go hiking and we go, snow, right. like, there's so many restaurants. So there's always a, like, we went to the Highland games out here. We go to the Highland games every year. Which right. is like, uh, do you know what the Highland Games are? Like the Scottish, like the, have you ever seen like where they toss the cable and fl like the big, uh, the tree log and flip it? Like yeah, in the I have, and stuff? I have. And I, uh, I have to, to tip my kilt to those guys. Yeah. Yeah. So they have like the regional championships out here and they have like, there's always something cool going on out here. So I really like Vegas and it's got a hustler mentality. It does. Like blue collar hustler. Like, so I really like it. And it's just, smaller than 15 million people so i'm happy about that too i like the music and the dj stuff but i'm not yeah. going to build on that big e oh you should go to berlin you should go to berlin i, I, should. I love edm shows i love the uh up tempo music it's really good for getting pumped and exercising oh yeah yeah absolutely i've got some playlists to share with you and if you ever go to berlin let me know i'll tell you where to go
Okay. Yeah, this is I epic. Love that city. I'll share. I lived this. there for four years. Oh, that's so yeah. cool. So I want to I want to circle back to something. I, I like to ask my listeners at the beginning of the interview. Apparently now it's like 14 minutes in. This is what happens. I get caught up in these amazing stories with hearing um, guests pass and stuff. But what if you could meet three people, living or dead, anyone? Who would you meet? What three people would you meet and why? Oh my gosh. Booyah. See, <laughs> you're not ready. My last guest, he knew I was going to ask it. It was like, Ur. oh man. Oh, this sounds so bad. I want to be real though. It can't be Odin or Loki from, um, from Norse mythology. Oh, okay. Oh, hey. Okay. Um, I, I would want to meet, I want to meet Genghis Khan. <laughs> I would want to meet Genghis Khan because I, oh, this sounds so terrible. I have a fascination with dictators um, because like it is unbelievable to me how people like just the mindset to want and desire and pursue that much power. And like, I don't know, like people like, like Fidel Castro and Adolf Hitler and Gabi and stuff. It's like, I don't know. It's just so, I don't know. It's wild to me. So I would want to meet Genghis Khan because I mean, talk about like the ultimate warrior mindset. Um, We're 15 minutes in and Hitler's already come up. I mean. Ah! I know you can't say I want to meet Adolf Hitler. I don't really want to meet Adolf Hitler. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, no I but I think. But like, if you think about like, like dictators in the power and not like, not like a perverse, like, oh, I want that much power, but just no, like I get it. to be somebody, yeah, to be somebody who desires that much power and like desires that kind of, I mean, I think it's very different, like, like the, the Genghis Khan mindset versus like the modern dictators and modern society. It's very different because like Genghis, I mean, that was like 1500 years ago. Like you gotta, right. Like that's, it's like totally, it's a, I mean, it's literally like, those are very different humans and how they live their life and survival and stuff you like that. You could say that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, but I want to know his like warrior mindset and how he led men and how he talked to his like first, his first and second in command and how he, yeah, I want to, I want to, I want to like live a life as his like third in command and just like be around the man and like see how and like talk to him about his philosophy on on leadership and conquering and like battle and strategy um yeah so there's that one um i would really like to meet and spend a day with lauren bacall <laughs> okay wow that's a beautiful choice <laughs> yeah kind of awesome yeah, Lauren Bacall, um, for any listeners that don't know, she was, uh, she was an absolutely stunningly handsome and gorgeous woman who was very famous in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Actually, she acted throughout her whole career. Um, but she was very special in the way that she had so much alluring presence. She was a skinny little thing. And she was about 19 years old when she first had her lead role and she was against, she was her opposite with Humphrey Bogart and she captured his attention. And this man was two, he was twice her age and he was the Hollywood man. Like he was the it man of the day and he was right. so masculine and she, and their back and forth, which most of it was improv was just so good. And she had such a, she had such a commanding presence about her, despite her just being like a small life, but beautiful woman. And I think that, um, that is like, like a woman like that is like the epitome of feminine, soft feminine power. Okay. And I really appreciate that. Um, right. yeah. So Genghis Khan, Lauren McCall and anyone alive. <laughs> They're um, not worth I don't know. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to go pick somebody who's actually very accessible right now. Uh, just because, uh, uh, Zach Hommel, he is, uh, he's also on, he's on Twitter. He is, um, he's a gym owner and power lifter outside of Indiana, Indiana, Indianapolis. He's not paying me to be here. Don't worry. Um, but, but he's no, he just, he has so much knowledge in the sport of strength training and weightlifting. Um, he studied under Louis Simmons and, uh, from Westside Barbell. These are just like deep cuts from the weightlifting community. But he just seems to have like a really wonderful understanding of strength and conditioning, especially with weightlifting. Yeah. And I would love to talk to him about his training philosophy and like 
being able to triage lifts and just, just, I just want to talk shop with him. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, from those three, we've got a classical model of femininity. We've got a masculine lifter. And then we've got someone whose mindset of conquest you respect. So, I mean, I think that's a great trifecta that represents some of your approaches to your field, right? Of kind of the, oh, yeah. the masculine and the overarching desire to have some mastery and coach people on what it means to take ownership of their lives. Maybe not sire thousands of children as Genghis Khan did. Yeah. But, that, but I mean, I yeah. mean, few people, but more about that productivity mindset. Yeah, absolutely. But also just like strategy, like yes. strategy is very important. Um, and strategy is actually um, a trait that belongs to, if we talk about like archetypes and stuff, it belongs to the goddess Athena because right. like attack and action, these are masculine traits, but strategy, strategy is being able to uh, like to have, to have a goal, but be able to predict and assume the um, like uh, the physical and emotional reactions of your enemy and to be able to work with them and work around them. And that's a very feminine trait, but, and I think right. his ability um, to use strategy and more and like, le uh, yeah. And also just leadership of men. I think that that like, these are of men, meaning humans. Um, I think that these are just, I think it's good qualities. Absolutely. Well, so there, the, the goddess Sophia, uh, or AKA wisdom is feminine, right? So we've mm -hmm. got, we've got that angle too of wisdom and then the, the warrior wisdom of Athena, I don't think there's a coincidence there, really. Yeah. The, the archetype seems pretty widespread. So as you're talking, I'm thinking of two book recommendations. And I know I've mentioned one before, so I'll just go with that one. But uh, The Dictator's Handbook, have you heard of that before? Oh, my God, no. <laughs> no. No, I ordered it, and I read some of it, and it's very tongue-in-cheek. And there's a foreword where the authors who they are essentially, like, you, I didn't know who they were. Bueno de Mesquita, Bruce... Uh, Br I, okay. Bruce Smith. Okay. It's listed. The authors are listed in a weird way. I'm looking at my Amazon order here when I ordered it. Um, I wanted to get the whole title. It's the dictator's handbook. Why bad behavior is almost always good politics. And mm -hmm. they explain in their foreword that they're trying to, in a tongue in cheek way, almost like Machiavelli's the prince, right? Look at bad behavior and why it persists in politics. And it's because staying in power versus helping the people is often a, they are goals that are at odds. So that's a great book that goes over the stuff that you were talking about. And also, Tyrannical Minds, Psychological Profiling, Narcissism, and Dictatorship by Dean Haycock. That's oh, a pretty good book. Wow. I've read a little more of that one. And I have to say, it, it goes into the diagnostics criteria for narcissism, for psychopathy. Well, now it's um, antisocial personality disorder. But you know what we used to look at as psychopathy, uh, you would you would really like it, Ingrid. Oh yeah, I'd love that. I'll totally yeah. I'll totally check those out. I'll send you the links. I'll send you the titles, yeah, please and do I'll put it, it in the podcast Good. description because there are a lot of people, including myself, who find it fascinating to look at what makes the I think it, it what makes these personalities tick. And I think one of the reasons may be, and you can chime in if you think this is right or not. I think the further we get away from people who had a singular vision and were very driven, and we get into this culture of thoroughly saturating distractions that we wonder how people could be so focused, right? We see everyone around mm -hmm. us typically is, is kind of offset and distracted by something. And even ourselves, we get, it's e so easy to grow distracted and diverted in our attention that we, we think of these dictators who are certainly not admirable for nearly anything, but they do have a singularity of focus that seems fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, like risk of talking about Hitler again. I mean, that guy was democratically voted into power. At a right. Time yeah. So suffering, you know, and like, uh, and this, he just promised so many good things for Germany. And in right. fact, like, yeah, oh man, I was slippery, I'm walking on a slippery slope on a public forum because people can totally misconstrue what I'm saying. But like, you know, the, the, the organizational system that we had for public transport, how we like design modern cities were based on innovations from his people. Well, um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I didn't know that actually. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, so, but like people in power can also inspire great things out of other people. And like, so it's, yeah. So like, I mean, it, the mindset is fascinating, right? But Yeah. <laughs> I do understand. No, and a disclaimer, we're just talking about the mindset here. I get it. I mean, yeah, yeah. 
this bizarre phrase, Mussolini made the trains run on time. You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like, so Benito Mussolini, the the really rabid, unbelievably brutal dictator um, of, of Italy, fascist Italy. I mean, there's, there's that, that's the hyper order masculinity side of things. Right. And that can really go off the, off the wall. Um, A lot of medical breakthroughs, sadly, that people know now about blood clotting come from the, the, the negative German past of uh, World War II era, Nazi Germany. Yeah. Like, do we, it's a philosophical issue of, do you take that stuff, the fruits of it, is that, is that condoning it or are you using it now in a way to understand that so the patients don't die? And I leave that to listeners to think about, but um, yeah. It's, it's a very, it's very ethically dubious stuff. So I actually have something very important to add to that. When I was please. in uh, going through rescue summer school, we, um, so we learned a huge portion of our training was to learn how to rewarm people from being in hypothermic or semi hypothermic wow. from okay. rescue them from the ocean. Right. So, um, so we had to learn how to rewarm bodies and we had to learn how to keep people like warm and safe and like not how not to do it too quickly, too too slowly, like how to, like who is going to survive, like what kind of swim, like when you triage, uh, when you triage a crash site, who to save first, um, because like based on who's been in the water or like, like, cause especially when it's like sub-zero temperatures, like you have to, like you have to act quickly and somebody who's been in the water 17 minutes versus somebody who's been in the water 11 minutes. Like, of course you're like, no, we're going to save the one who's been in there longer. It's like, yeah, that person's already dead. Like they might be still alive in these next two minutes, but like literally like we can't save them. You need to save the person 11 minutes from now. And so it's stuff that's like, you have to make incredibly hard decisions at a time of crisis. Wow. But I found out that this, what we had, like, I was like wondering about like, how do we know this? And it was because like Nazi Germany ran this, in, these incredibly outrageous and devastating experiments, like freezing the people in these Jewish, con- on these, in these all encompassing, whatever they didn't approve of concentration and death camps. And um, there was actually a professor in the University of Duluth, Minnesota. A lot of men were dying from, they were dying from uh, hypothermia and ex, like overexposure, ice fishing. They would wow. fall into the water and yeah, they were ice fishing Minnesota. And so this university professor, he was trying to create a PSA and distribute a public handbook about how to rewarm your friends after ice fishing. But he needed access to this, incredibly horrible quote scientific data that um these uh that the nazi scientists uh ran because you can't do these experiments on people you can't even do them on volunteers because it's like incredibly irresponsible of you as a scientist to like put people in such life-threatening situations just in the name of science right but not absolutely enough to do it so there was he actually he found that in order to work with this material he had to petition his case to, um, it was like the Jewish Ethical Commission, the Jewish Ethical Society, like the people who kind of governed over a lot of these like ethic, ethics issues having to do with Nazi Germany. And they decided ultimately that they should release the data because then, if, and I might, I'm probably going to choke up here, but if they did not release that data, if they didn't let him use it, then all those people who died in these experiments just died in vain then their death helped nobody. And if they were able to release this data and use it for a good cause and possibly save lives, then thank God they were given, they did something useful for all their suffering. God. And I think that's a really important lesson. Wow. That's extremely sobering. I think that's just spectacularly morbid to think about, but yeah. the redemptive quality of that work and saving future lives is, yeah isn't it it's like you know we you know we like to think that the world like in talking in politics like we like to think that like one side is red blue or red black or white like it's but you know what like like really when we talk about the question of morality it is so much more complex and context gives every context is everything and you never know uh, it's uh yeah like <laughs> it's so crazy to yeah think context about. is king and we really never know i mean twi- twitter is wonderful to connect people and it's helped me meet people like you and others who are just great voices whose stories can inspire so many people 
and also the short form posts and even threads don't suffice to communicate context. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's so, it can be very dehumanizing, depersonalizing. People can find it so easy to argue with an avatar and a few words, right? Like a little, little image in some words. And it does, it's not like a debate where you're seeing in real time someone's reactions and empathizing with that right brain empathic function. You're, you're not, it's just the left brain logic side and then some anger thrown in the mix for good measure. Um, and we miss good conversations because of that, I think. And, and that's one reason I like to interview people and do podcasts is because it really expands on the, the narrative in a way that you can't do with just the short form little yeah tweet. absolutely absolutely and like plus like dude my thumbs are like i cannot like <laughs> i can't sit there and like type like i can't waste so much of my time typing all this because it's no just, like, you have to have real discussions you have to have real discussions and I, actually my boyfriend and i were very good about um once a season just about we throw a little party a little soiree called a uh, whiskey and philosophy night Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And it's um sometimes we get very philosophical, sometimes it's just casual conversation. Uh but the whole point is that you're talking. And the whole point is also like, dude, if you get offended or you get outraged or you say something just to blow people up, like you're not invited back. You know, like this is a this is a time for open minds and open thoughts. And it's been such a joy. Like I've managed to meet some incredibly level-headed people from both sides that are actually open and willing to have a conversation about this. Yeah. Like to the point where my boyfriend's like, should we like record these conversations? Like, should we have like a podcast? Or I was like, I don't know how you would do it because like, what are we going to do? Like pick a theme, pick a topic. It all just seems to, it seems to rehearse if we start doing like themes and topics. And so, I mean, maybe it'll grow into something like that, but yeah. It's really nice to know, especially in a place like Los Angeles, that you can come and you can have like an open discussion where nobody is trying to fight, nobody is trying to hurt feelings, and nobody is trying to get a point across. But like we're actually talking about logic, we're talking about philosophy, we're talking about legislation, we're not talking about politics that is actually just a gossip col like column from whoever's in the Senate or the White House or, you know. So it's like yeah. it's it's been really cool. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, um, I think it's important people to be able to do that and see who they're talking with sometimes and, and get clarification w when needed. Oh, yeah, yeah. And some of the greatest friendships have been kind of formed out of this uh, whiskey and philosophy night um, just because, like, you're like, oh, I never would have thought I was friends with a Republican or a Democrat sure. or whatever. They're like, oh, we actually agree on way more than we thought. So you've inspired yeah. me. I think we need to do something like that with the group that I'm a part of on Twitter, the Ion Media individuals who do like the Ion A I O N is like the Jungian idea of the differentiated oh. perfect self, basically. And so Garrett Daly, the guy who coordinated that group, he reached out to me and and, and recruited me like a year ago, and I was kind of a contributor and would add little things here and there. I'm on the email list. I'll write emails, but um, lately I've gotten more involved so that he, he loves to have conversations about philosophy especially Jung I mean being in the mental health field I know a little bit about Carl Jung that's putting it mildly mm -hmm. but he studies the esoteric more metaphysical stuff oh because um, he was the grandfather of astrology <laughs> uh, what yeah Carl Jung yeah, yeah he was he was huge into astrology yes, yes absolutely yeah, astrology yeah absolutely well astrology Twitter is absolutely enormous too my gosh it's yeah big. which yeah. Yeah, you know, people want to find coincidences of things and they want to know what to do to live. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Anything that brings a little bit of, like, self-awareness and center clarity, I believe, is yeah. always useful, no matter well, like the medium. Enneagram, too. You know, you heard of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. I haven't taken – I don't know my number yet. That's, so. Yeah, yeah. I don't – I haven't taken that yet. I'm going to, but it. I'm more into trauma work and things of that nature. So yeah. Speaking of that subject, let's just delve right into, do you notice any kind of gaps or pet peeves? What pet peeves do you have in other words with mental health care or the, the mores of psychology, the norms of psychotherapy in America today or anywhere really, since you've traveled abroad, do you notice anything about differences, similarities? 
Oh yeah. Um, I mean, you know, because of my algorithm, <laughs> like because of my Google algorithm and because of like just who I associate with, I always think it's common knowledge, but, um, and if you haven't heard it before, then I'll be the first to tell you. But if you've heard it a million times, then I'll be the millionth and one person to tell you. Sure. Like in America, we just tend to just, we put a pill on everything. Oh yeah. The medical uh, model. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so sad. And even in Western countries like uh, Norway and Germany, where, where I've spent an extensive amount of time, uh, I, and I say that because I use those as my most frequent examples, but those are just my most, most intimate relationships with another culture is from Norway and Germany. Um, they are way more into natural cures. Like they're way more into uh, like trying to get it. Yeah. They're just like trying to solve naturally. They're much more hesitant to um, give people antibiotics or stuff like UTIs or common cold or something like that. Just because like, like they're just like, no, that we, they believe in a more like naturopathic approach before you take other approaches. I mean, it could sure. just be because of the culture there. They have a, um, typically in cold Northern European countries, there's like, a, they, uh, I mean, sometimes you would, they grew up having to like trudge through snow for miles and miles on end before they got to the nearest doctor or hospital. So there's like a big, I think naturally there's a big culture of like, self-care and being able to like take care of things what you take care of yourself with what you have at home before it gets too bad yeah but also modern why like in modern times like socialized medicine is just super expensive to give everybody like pills and invasive treatment and, it tests is, isn't and it? like that yeah so um so in america um yeah we just tend to we just tend to put a pill on it we uh the good old protestant guilt for not working hard enough we're in europe America is the only country I've ever been to where people brag about how, how hard they've worked in when I was living in Berlin, it was about like how much time they spent with their family, how much they got to work, how much vacation they got, if they got to sleep in, it was like, yeah. And I was like, I'm so grateful to hear people like brag about how much time off they took instead of how much time on they had. What a novel idea. Yeah. Right. Like what if we gave vacation to what if we gave like paid and unpaid vacation to workers? So it was like, I challenge you to take 17 days off a season. Like that's a fair amount of vacation. Like, and people would have to kind of like struggle to like meet the demands of their work and take vacation. But I think that's how it should be actually. Sure. It should take way more time off and we don't necessarily have to pay them for that. But to be quite honest, like in my field, like weightlifters, like we need so little to be happy. It's like, food a place to sleep and people to lift with and we're so happy and most of us just like are saving up to go on vacations and like to go literally go lift weights and sleep in a bed and eat good food with people that we like in a different country and in a different place and it's like why can't like if you i i truly believe and i've seen it over and over again that 99.9 .9 percent of people will take less money for more time off because it actually means a higher quality of life so yeah. So, I mean, that's just, yeah, <laughs> that's my critique. I, I tend to stay away here in America. I tend to stay away from like doctors and therapists and stuff like that. Um, I, therapy has greatly helped me, but now I'm at a point in my life where I like do a lot of writing and purpose, but I also make sure that I have an open dialogue with my friends and my family and my partner um, so that I am able to like, just have like, normal expressive communicative relationships and talk to wise people whom I look up to but with problems in my life and like make sure that I like kind of do a lot of like introversion like introverted self-reflection and get to the root of my problems well I mean journaling is therapeutic we know that yeah. and Wait, that being said I have a lot of tools in the belt because I went through rehab and I went through therapy absolutely so. <laughs> and the measure of success yeah. is if you can I tell clients I have what most an hour a week with you and mm -hmm. the real change is going to happen if you mobilize what we learn in here into those other countless hours beyond what we have. And so clearly you've done that. Journaling is therapeutic. Interpersonal efficacy. I mean, talking to your partner, talking to others and working things out, that is the nature of, of therapy and what we want people to have coming out of it. So, I mean, that's just perfect. And now taking it on to others, that's a huge thing. And that's really that brings me to this the idea that people need different approaches therapeutically. And I went to a training last year by the lady who started this man therapy campaign here in Colorado, where I live. And 
one of the things she, so she distilled down a bunch of different things could be helpful for men when you're counseling them. And one thing is they want to learn tools that they can take to others. Well, why is that? Because there's not the pity component, right? There's the empowerment mm -hmm. component of I'm helping you and now you can take this out in the world versus you're broken and I'm going to fix you as the therapist, which is disempowering on so many levels. But yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Powerful <laughs> stuff. Um, did you and your dad ever, so, so for listeners out there, I, uh, I briefly kind of looked at your recent tweets. Um, your, you and your dad went on a recon mission to find German brats in Vegas. How did that go? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> it went pretty well. There's a, there's a picture on Instagram. It was a Friday. We were both, I was wearing a Hawaiian Prince dress and he had his ah. Hawaiian shirt on. We had our hats. It was, I'm pretty close with my dad. He, um, that's good. My mom was a breadwinner and he raised me. So yeah. So we went on this recon mission. They moved out to Vegas a couple years ago and where we grew up, there was this, uh, German butcher. My dad is the, uh, Deutsche Phil. He's the, the German, he's Swiss German. He lived in Germany and he taught us German. And yeah. So, um, so we were actually lived right up the street from a German butcher where he, um, would get his cuts of meat. He would make this a uh, special thing. Uladen. It's this very delicious traditional German, uh, dish. And, uh, you need a, you need a specific kind of butcher for that. And he used to also get like dried sausages, like Lan Diego and these like dried hot sticks and stuff. And he missed those from LA. So we've been doing these recon missions, like checking out all of the uh, international market, food marketplaces and stuff. And we actually found this uh, place called Tina's Gourmet Sausages just up and around the corner. Yeah. And, yeah, I know, right? And he, the guy there is Ukrainian and he has food from every country that was invaded by Germany or Russia between 1900 and 1950. Like, no joke. It's like all Eastern European, former Iron Curtain countries and German food. And so it is like, oh my gosh, it's so great to go in there and see all that kind of stuff. But he, it was, uh, he has more Hungarian sausages. So they're like, my dad says they were a little bit too fatty for his taste. He likes the lean <laughs> cuts. Oh, like cats. So we're still, we're still, uh, we're still doing our recon missions. We're probably actually going to go on one tomorrow. Um, but we did, we did find a good German cafe with nice tart sauerkraut. So yeah. <laughs> something. So what was it like growing up with a stay at home dad? Because people have different opinions on that and I empower people to do whatever works for their family. And I think that it's, yeah. it's right to do so. Talk to me a little bit about that if you're comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I never realized how unique my situation is was until I was older and definitely like probably in the military. Um, and um, I, I remember being sort of like, a, uh, I was in the military. We were waking up three times a week at this point in my training. We were waking up three times a week at three 30 in the morning for a 4 a.m. muster for PT physical training. And I always noticed, and I was at the air wing base, I was at the, like the aviation base, it's in Pensacola, Florida, and that's where we have a mixture of Marines and sailors. And um, so we used to work out, so I was a sailor, I was, in the, I was in the Navy, we worked out, we always worked with a lot of Marines in the air wing unit. So um, I always noticed that there were all of these women, and especially like a lot of female Marines that were like sitting around during PT doing nothing. And I was like, whiskey tango foxtrot <laughs> what's going on and um and all these and i was told by one of this because i i mean i love pt i used to just like run circles around people and i would like a, run circles around the marines and uh, all right. yeah <laughs> and uh um i took great pride in that i also really loved physical training because like i it was it was a military like you just embrace the good parts when you can you know so um so I asked one of my sergeants about this and I was like, what's going on with these women over here? And he's like, Oh, they're all LLD, like light limited duty. And I was like, light. I was like, they're all injured. He's like, no, most of them are getting their period. And he was very annoyed by that. And I was like, what? Like these girls are just like opting out of physical training, something that's so important to what we do here because they're getting their period. I was like, that would have never flied in my house. And like, I just had all of these, I had all of these like epiphanies, just like, I was like, God, I would have never been able to get away. Like my dad would not let me get away with that. Like I could not get away with that. And I realized that like my dad was just like, 
he raised me like one of the guys. He raised me like one of the boys. He never, I never, I never had girl jobs. I did manual labor, mowed the lawn, moved the rocks, like hauled cement and poured cement, just like my brothers, like helped them with electrical. Um, he, you know, I played sports. He, he also cooked for us because my mom was gone a lot. So he did, I mean, he was a stay at home dad and, but he was never mom. He was always dad. So he was authoritative. He was a leader. I mean, he gave hugs and kisses and came to our games when he showed up, you know, he was a wonderful man. Um, but it, yeah, it was just, I was definitely, I was raised by with, with a strong male presence and I was raised that, uh, just because I was a woman didn't mean that like I couldn't or shouldn't do anything. And I literally never heard like, because you're a girl or like girls don't do that. Like I just heard because you're a part of this family, you're going to do this. Like, and that's it. Like there were, I literally never ever thought about like gender norms. Right. I was going to say you weren't gender. limited by gender stereotypes. No, we were, we were, it was, whoever, yeah, whoever was available to work for a family. Like my mom was a doctor and she was working all the time. She didn't have time to cook or clean. And like when she did, like, do you think she wanted to? Like she was like, everybody's like, oh yeah, your dad married well. It was like, shit, my mom married well. Like my dad, like he taught us how to scrub toilets and do the laundry. So he didn't have to do it. <laughs> uh, but he also like, he cooked for us. He picked us up from school. He made our lunches every day. He came home, he did the bills. Like he did everything. Like he took care of my mom, you know? And like, so all my mom had to do was go do the work and come home and enjoy time with her family. Wow. So when a family yeah. finds a great setup, it's, it's all about communication. It's all about who's going to do what task. It doesn't have to be a gendered thing. It's yeah. best at whatever task it is. It's a, it's a beautiful thing when it works like that. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I just had a conversation like literally just before this podcast with my dad, since I'm, I'm in Vegas and I'm hanging out with them for a little bit. Um, yeah. uh, he was like, I mean, he's got, he's got a PhD. Like I've heard it from both sides. Like he's also got a PhD in ancient Germanic linguistics and he's got his general contracting license. And like with my mom, who's a physician, she, I remember in a conversation with her before she said that she was like, yeah, I think it was, you know, it was really important to your dad to like go back to school and get his PhD, like to make him feel like, like, he, like he too was a doctor and he had the mental capacity. He's right. always been such a philosopher and he's very, sure. he's incredibly smart. And, um, and then like talking to my dad, like my dad said, he was like, you know, like when we first got married, like I was making more than your mom. Cause we were talking about finances and money and like sure. my boyfriend and I are talking about our future and stuff. And, uh, right. so, um, he was, he said, uh, you know, when we first got married, I made more money than your mom. And we tried like joint to, like separate bank accounts, but well, we never have enough money. And then like our earnings switched and then uh, I got injured and couldn't work. And then, uh, you know, so, and then your mom, we had kids and things changed. And he was like, and he like said flat out, he's like, you know, like I, he's like, I earn no money. I bring nothing to the table as far as that's concerned. He's like, I'm wow. not ashamed to admit it. He's like, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I bring great value in other ways. And I just looked at him and I was just like on my inside, I was like, fuck yeah, you did. Like he built my mom three houses and raised three of her kids. Like he cooked, he did all of her bills. Like he made sure that her calendar was taken care of. But like, dude, my dad is like, he's a man of great value and he didn't earn like nearly a cent for this family, but he made this whole family possible. And like, I think that's amazing. And like, and it doesn't matter who is it. And like women need to realize that too. Like, you can make your whole family possible. Like, listen, like, listen, do you know how much money you can save if you just have like a freaking one toolbox and a drain snake? Like, <laughs> if you can like fix a shelf or know how to turn off the water or unclog a drain, like you can That's save empowerment. Save yeah. bills on plumbing. Yeah, exactly. But save on family repairs, like on like, and plus it's just like, you don't have to earn money to bring value to like your family and what you do. And in fact, right. you should be very wary of anybody who's like, well, I make the money. So I have to say, because then they're using money as a control mechanism. It's a bargaining chip. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's and my mom, the other person. Exactly. And my mom never did that. She was never like that. She was grateful to hand over control because like, dude, she is a big person in her field. She's a chief of medicine at LA County 
LA County, USC, like chief of medicine for 25 years, then she was chief of medicine down at UCLA. Like she has a lot of responsibility and the last thing she wants to do is come home and have to be the boss again at her family. She's so glad that my dad took care of that. So yeah, so I think it's just like, yeah, being raised by my dad, I don't know if you're allowed to curse, but it was fucking awesome. Yeah, you can <laughs> like, do that. We'll just put this one as explicit. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> and it, it was just... I'm fine with that. Yeah, it ah. was great. It was absolutely great. And I learned more. I like... And because my dad... I guess my dad's a renaissance man. My dad had a, like an acting background. So he knew how... He knew how to teach women how to walk in heels. And he knew like appropriate makeup. So like when I was like dabbling in the feminine arts as a young teen, he'd be like, Ingrid either the eyes or the lips. Don't do both. It's too much. It's too much makeup, you know? And I'd be like, okay, I <laughs> could take off my lipstick. Wow. Like, yeah. It was like, it was a Renaissance man building houses, yeah. makeup artistry. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, people ask me how it was for me. It was normal. And like, now that I'm older, I am truly grateful because because it was not the norm, we weren't like, we didn't have any boxes to tick because I think that like, I don't know, maybe if it had been my mom at home, like it would have been like, okay, well, like this is just how things are done or blah, blah, blah. But because we had no mold and like he was raising kids in the eighties and the nineties. And that's like, I guess that's like super progressive. There are way more stay at home dads. Now he never participated in the PTA meetings because all these like kind of like lonely, desperate housewives were like, Oh, you're raising your children. So sexy. And like, he thought it was like super creepy and he's a faithful man. So like he just had to stop going to PTA meetings because these lazy was, ladies would get after him. But like, I mean, it was like, it was a yeah, deal. Was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was a total, I, I like to say filth. I think it's a little, wow. a little more risque of a term. Right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it was like being raised by him was super awesome. And I'm very, I'm so grateful that I have a good relationship with my dad. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, I think it's important to live outside the scope of gender stereotypes for sure. Mm -hmm. And when you don't know what boxes you're supposed to fit into, you will live outside of them and do things that you didn't think were even possible. Yeah. Three houses, yeah. built three houses. That's extremely impressive, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. He takes great pride in that. Yeah. It's pretty cool stuff. So we've already covered so much awesome material, but I want to make sure we discuss your approach to nutrition and exercise and what empowered you to get on Twitter and share that stuff and get into it. You can, you can talk about just getting into it after leaving the military, obviously, because you were really primed and ready to go with that. I mean, that gave you the background. And then yeah. Twitter. Yeah. The military definitely gave me, um, since my dad was like pretty authoritarian and he ran a tight ship, like being in the military was very uh, uh, affirming to like my mindset and my approach. Um, but I, I came to Twitter fairly late in the game and I came to Twitter because like I'd always had, like I'd wanted to do an online business, online business and being a good looking woman, everybody's like, you should be on Instagram. And quite frankly, like I don't like that medium. I'm a pretty private person and I'm not really into sexually overtly selling myself. Like I don't mind being, being a little like sexy and risque every once in a while, but like that is not my brand. Like right. that is like, I just, because like, it's just not like, um, the uh, women have many other qualities. Beauty is one. And like, you don't necessarily have to be sexually overt, um, in order to be alluring or in order to be powerful as a woman. Right. Um, Agreed. Yeah. So, uh, perspective. And I agree that women have the right to do either one and you're, it's valid for you to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, I just couldn't get into this, like working out in booty shorts with just my sports bra on or like, uh, like, uh, like just butt shots and stuff like that. And I just found it really overwhelming. And I think the platform, especially for young women is very tough because like it also perpetuates the cycle of like self comparison. Um, I mean, now I know enough about social media that I can like sort of curate my own message, but I was just sort of like, I don't know, Instagram. And then like when I was trying to get into it and Instagram changed their algorithm and it was just it's like, I can't do this. I don't know. Um, it's, too okay. overwhelming. it's too overwhelming for me right now. Sure. Um, so I, um, I actually know Alexander Juan Antonio Cortez. 
I know him as just Alex. Oh, um, yeah. I interviewed him for my podcast. Yeah, he actually, we, we kind of go way back. He was, we worked at West Hollywood Crunch Fitness together in 2013. Wow. So, yeah. And so I actually, I knew just from being around meatheads for a while and from being around men for, I was like, this guy's different. Like he's got a really unique approach. And then when I started hanging out with him longer, like I found out he was a dancer and like he was so wordy. He's always been very philosophical and thinks about things. And of course, I, I love that. Like, I think that's like, I love conversing with people who just think too much about stuff. <laughs> it's wonderful. Tell and, me about it. It's good yeah, stuff. It is. And, um, and he, uh, so I just sort of, we just sort of like, loosely stayed in touch over the years I went over my I went I was in Berlin and I kind of followed his work because he was writing for a couple of uh weightlifting blogs that I followed and I right you know, so I just kind of stayed in touch with him and then I just saw him dude I just saw him achieve great success through Twitter and I was like really inspired by that and like when I got on Twitter I was just sort of like a voyeur for a little bit but I, that was the first like I mean that was the first like I know somebody who did it. I know it's not that complicated. And I know like, but I, but I, that was the first one where I truly saw success happen. Like it was just some person that I knew who was in my position and, um, and he was just, he was a great success on Twitter. And I was like, you know, I could do this too. And that was like my first one. And so I was just sort of like a voyeur. And then I just got really into Twitter because like, it's conversation and it's personality and it's not about booty shots. It's about like how much you know and how much value you can bring to people. And my whole life, like in my entire professional career, all I've done was teach people. And in fact, my boyfriend is like, you have to learn when to scale back. Cause when you're trying to like, when you're trying to like network and get clients, like if you give out too much information then they don't come back, they don't come back and buy anything. Right. Repeat customers. You got to give them enough to get, I, I get what he's yeah. saying. Yeah. He's like, it's like the one minute rule. Like if you don't, if it takes you longer than one minute to explain it and it has to do with your profession, then they need to, they need to get a consultation with you. So yeah. So I was, That's so helpful to know. Yeah, yeah. It's a very helpful rule. And I, cause you can even, you don't even have to be smooth about it. At some point, you're just like, you're just like, yeah, you know, this is like a lot complicated. Here's my card. Why don't you just give me a call? We'll set up a, a consultation or a phone call and we can like figure this out because this needs a little bit more help than I'm able to give at this time. Yeah. Uh, like I need more information from you. You need more information from me. And that's, that's the truth. Like that's seriously the truth. And plus like you should value for your work. But anyway, I saw Alex be quite successful using this medium and I, found that Twitter aligned with my values. Um, and it was like way more effective than like being on Instagram was too, because it was just such a visual, very shallow society. And then yeah, quite absolutely. Frankly, okay. I mean, yeah, I get I, where you're coming from. Yeah. And I wanted to, I wanted to attract and like to talk to people who uh, were readers and writers and thinkers and thought a lot more about life. And so Twitter was just a good medium for me to do that. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, what energized you to go from military to nutrition coach coaching? My, well, it first started with my, it first started with fitness and it's right. been nutrition the last like two or three years as well, right. because, um, I, I like depth <laughs> and I found that just working out with people was not enough that I like in order to make true lasting change in somebody's life, I also need to change nutrition, um, their nutrition, because that is like first and foremost, how you eat is how you love yourself. Like true. Yeah. done. Um, so, but I originally, I, from the military to this, I remember I was talking to my mom and I was out of the military and I was out of the military early. I expected to serve at least four years, if not 20. Um, and I was like, I didn't know what I was going to study. I knew I was going to go back. And like, keep in mind, like, I am also newly sober. So like, I was in like the first three years of like my sobriety and, okay. um, or yeah. And, uh, so I was like, there's still like a lot of like distrust in myself. And so I was like, I, w I know I want to go back to school and it was mil the military actually showed me that I wanted to go back to school but I didn't know what I was going to study. And, um, and I was talking to my mom and she was just like, you know, like 
I think you should just study like exercise science because I really can't see you going from airport to airport and office to office. And I know you wanted to travel with what you do with like this. I was thinking about going into business. Um, but she was just like, I just really can't see you just being stuck in an office all day. I just don't think that's your personality type. And I was like, you are totally right. <laughs> so I just went into exercise science and I actually thought it was going to be kind of a soft science and it turns out it was not at all. So I got my degree in exercise physiology, kinesiology. So yeah. Yeah. And it served me well. <laughs> Where did you get that degree? Uh, uh, Cal State North California State University. Ooh, that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. See, son. <laughs> yeah. I'll tag Ajax in this because you know he's doing. He's starting a podcast too. He he's he's fun to interview to talk about like uh, mimetic stuff. Me mm -hmm. and and you and he knows about Lacan, Lacanian psychoanalysis, which is not all that commonly known to people who don't specialize in psychiatry or psychology. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about this. I'm definitely going to Google rabbit, rabbit hole that one. Yeah, well, it's like Freud, and I don't I want to derail too much and gloss, glaze over listeners' eyes with this because it's not, I mean, not what they're getting into the podcast one here. I'll do a whole episode on it. But the idea that, that Freud, uh, his works can be read like textual analysis. And so Lacan did that. Lacan's French. So he's going to take that French sort of philosophical spin and apply it to. Uh, psychoanalysis. He talks a lot about relationship with fathers and how fathers are more symbolic than anything else. It'd be really good to apply to your life, but it's it's mm. a whole thing. It's pretty cool. I, I'm not doing yeah. it justice because there's a lot of intricacies to it. Yeah. Well, I I also heard that uh, because we think of our mother as part of ourself, like the first relationship you have is with your father. Like, and that goes for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. We introject yeah. the mother state. Yeah, that gets into object relations psychology and some really cool stuff. And oh, I got wow. a smart audience here, so I know I can delve into it. But um, since I have you here, it's good to talk about your philosophical expertise on exercise stuff, your experiences. It's, uh, it's been mm -hmm. really helpful, I think. Your story ins will inspire a lot of people because if anyone thinks they can't do it, can't overcome any kind of addiction, any kind of problem behavior, if you have something that you're living for, if you have a goal, if you have some sort of endpoint, moving toward it every day, it, it just helps so much more than people would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then just like having something that's bigger than yourself. Like, uh, yeah, right. it's living so important. The moment. Yeah, like that people count on you. And I think a lot of people who are addicted, like they feel fundamentally as though they have no importance. And like when you realize, like when you have training that can save people lives, saves people's lives or like help people greatly, help people save their own lives. When you realize that there's like, a, and it doesn't even have to be that deep when you're just like looking to teach people to like enrich people. It's like, you are not alone. You are loved and you are important, you know, and you have to chase that. And there's a reason why you're alive. Like there's just, David Bowie said it best. I, I went to his, uh, this David Bowie um, uh, retrograde or it was, it was like, it was just basically his whole life, like in this museum, like all of his songs and his journals and a lot of his uh, costumes and stuff like this. And they started it out with 14 year old David Bowie. And he said he knew that he was strange. He knew that he was odd. He didn't fit in and he spent a lot of time alone he spent a lot of time drawing and there had been an epidemic of suicide in his family like his aunt has killed himself so he had a grandma and a great aunt and like a couple of men on his family and he knew that there was something wrong he knew that there was something different with him and he decided when he was 14 years old to do whatever it takes to express whatever he needed to express in order to not kill himself Wow. And I was like, really? Yeah, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> I was really taken aback by that because like, I have very much felt like that, like, um, that I wasn't, that life wasn't worth living, that it doesn't get better. And that, um, it, there's no point, uh, and it won't change, but you know what? I made a promise to myself to express and to do whatever it took in order to keep me alive and in order to not kill myself. And sometimes that's very macabre. And I've learned to like move beyond that thinking. But like 
Dude, when it gets dark, like just with every addict, with every sensitive soul, and with quite frankly, I think most people in this world, like when it gets really dark, it is dark. And, um, and like, just do whatever it takes, express whatever you need to express, say or do whatever you need to do. And like, be damned what anybody thinks of you. Like, as long as you're not hurting, like you not hurting yourself or other people is the most important thing. And just do what needs to be done, whatever it is. Yeah. Wow. That is a powerful message. And I think people need to hear that more. It, it prepare for the rough times when you're in the best of times, right? Really yeah. hold your identity and determine what it is that makes you thrive and what you want to communicate to the world. Cause you can cling to that in the times of real distress and chaos. Yeah, absolutely. Cause like, no matter what it is, good or bad, this too shall pass. <laughs> yeah. Living it, you're living. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So. <laughs> that is so powerful. That may be a good place to wrap up. Tell me if there's anything that you want to share that we haven't touched on. Cause I think it's a very powerful story here. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we just because of the nature of our conversation, we didn't get too far into nutrition, but really like nutrition and fitness, like how you feed yourself and how you move your body is truly how you love yourself. And if you want right. to make great strides and like your mental capacity and also like your self-confidence and self-trust and the ability, the well, ability let's explore to that a little bit. Yeah, say what okay. you think is important about nutrition stuff. I'd love for you to plug that. Talk about that more. We've got some time. I was just, okay. yeah. <laughs> I would just end on a super high note right there. Yeah. yeah but, um, I understand. Yeah. Uh, no, I nutrition, nut food is love. Whoever loved you, whoever took care of you, they fed you. And, uh, so when you grow older and especially if you live by yourself, like, you you have to feed yourself so um and like we are just discovering and i mean people have known it for thousands and thousands of years that food is not only fuel it is also medicine yeah and if you are like like it is just to aim to build self-confidence build self-trust even just build your skills and taking care of yourself build your like personal hygiene. Like I'm a big believer in feng shui, like having, like making your bed. Like, oh my gosh, when I got sober, it was like make, they made us make our bed. And I have made my bed, my bed every single day since October 16th, 2006. How do you remember <laughs> that? Okay. Oh, everybody remembers their sobriety date. Everybody. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I just remember. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, I have to say, I ha like full disclosure, I am not completely clean and sober. I was like completely clean and sober and drug free for like three years, but I was not, I don't really drink and I like smoke weed very rarely. Like as I haven't done this, I've done it in years, but it's like, I lead a healthy like lifestyle of like sobriety and cleanliness, but also yeah. like, I just like, I, I believe like, like my big self tools of staying calm, cool and collected are like being clean, being organized, like using cooking as a hobby, like using fitness as like therapy and just like physical emotion. Like I believe because I, I also like, I danced through college. So, and we, we had this phrase like dancing is physical emotion. And I believe like, even in like, when you do like weightlifting or endurance sports, yoga, like it is physical emotion. And you, you like, I'll meet people who just started doing yoga and like their entire like body changes because they're not physically holding on to tension. So then they can't internally hold on to tension. Yeah. And so like, yeah. So like if you're feeling down about your, if you're feeling down, you're feeling like you're depressed or you're out of control, like take control of the things you can't get control of. Like make your bed, spend 15 minutes a day cleaning something, learn how to scrub a toilet, learn how to make it, make soup, learn how to cook a chicken, learn how to lift weights, like learn how to like get a, just learn some things that will serve you for as long as you're here on earth and like taking care of this machine we call the body. Like I believe like chaos and demon lives in disorder. Like you can only, and I believe like, you know, it's gotta be clean enough to be, what is it clean enough to be organized, but dirty enough to be happy, you know? And I, you know, like we can't, yeah, you can't expect for it to look like architectural digest. I think that's also another like extreme. Um, but you know, it's like, like just learn these things to take care of your physical self. And then these, but these things are also, you know, they pay great dividends. So like taking care of your, 
spouse, taking care of your loved one, taking care of your partner, taking care of your family, being able to like cook nutritious meals and like, like keep it clean and tidy for family and like welcoming and like keeping a welcoming space. Um, like with outside of your body means that you're keeping a welcoming space inside of your head and inside of your heart. And I really believe that. Yeah. That's beautiful. What would you say are some big nutrition myths or, or some, and some foods to really avoid? Um, I less sugar and vegetable oil, anything you can, <laughs> unfortunately, like vegetable oil and sugar is in like 98% of the stuff that's out there. Um, but if you're learning to avoid these types of things, uh, your, your health will exponentially go up. Like it's, it's just a fact sugar is, uh, <laughs> that's like a whole nother podcast and just like the high ratio of omega six, those inflammatory oils and cold pressed vegetable oils and cooking with them. So cook with coconut oil, cook with avocado oil, cook with, uh, olive oil. Those are really good. like also like, um, save bacon fat, cook eggs and bacon fat and like, uh, like fat from bone broths and porks and stuff like that. Um, I believe in the stuff actually, if any of your listeners would like a great book on nutrition, it's called deep nutrition. It is literally like the Bible as far as like cooking and nutrition is talk, um, that I'm concerned about. Also, like when you learn to cook, you learn how to stretch a dollar. You learn how to stretch a dollar into two fifty because you can make five different meals from one chicken. Cause you're like, you make shredded chicken and you can like use the make bone broth and then you can make soup and you can do all this stuff. So, um, like cooking for meat on the bone, fermented food, fresh food. And then, uh, oh, there was a fourth one and I'm totally forgetting it, but it's like the pillars. Oh, organ meats, organ meats. They're so nutritious and people shy away from them because, um, as society got wealthier, uh, we didn't have to eat organ meats, like eating from nose to tail was something that peasants did because like they were only, they only got one cow for the season. So they had to make it last. So they were eating the innards and they were eating the liver and they were eating. But like, if you look at wolves, whenever they attack and kill an animal, they go straight for the innards because that's where all the nutrition is. And we really need to get like innards and liver and all the, the bone broth, like back into our nutrition, because that's where wonderful glucosamine is for our joints and our tendons. That's the stuff that's going to let us live and move until 150 or 200 years old, right? That's what like health and fitness is talking about, keeping people alive that long. If that's the case, our joints need to be healthy. And that means eating meat on the bone, eating bone marrow, eating liver, eating innards. Um, yeah. And then like fermented food, probiotic, the gut brain health, gut brain connection and like how that's really good for mental health. And then fresh vegetables, fresh vegetables. And you can always, and people are like, I don't know, fresh vegetables are so expensive. I was like, you can literally buy lentil beans and sprout them and have fresh sprouted lentil salad within three or four days. And that'll cost you like 50 cents a pound. You're like a pound of lentils. Like, do you know how big that is? That's so much salad. That is so many lentil sprouts and you can use it over and over and over again. So like the best thing you can do for your health, your overall health and for your wallet is to learn how to cook. Boom. <laughs> like, that's it. <laughs> that's beautiful. Wow. Avoid sugar and vegetable oil. Eat some yeah. bones and organs. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Be a bonehead. That's your Twitter followers. Bonehead. Boneheads. Just yeah. Kidding. Yeah. Oh God, that's great. What do you, um, what do you think about, uh, weightlifting versus cardio. What's the right ratio of that? I mean, I'm not trying to give away your trade secrets here. Oh no. I, I mean, shoot. I give away, I, I give it away for free on Twitter. You know, Yeah. if you follow me, you can save a lot of money too. Um, also please book a consultation because everybody's different. <laughs> uh, yes, it is. Everybody's different guys. So yeah. We all have different time constraints and sometimes we just need a, a little bit of inspiration to figure out what the next step is. Yes. Uh, okay. um, weightlifting versus cardio. I mean, it depends on what your goals are. Obviously. Um, I think weightlifting is superior because most people, if we're talking about most people, most people get into exercise to quote, lose weight. What they really want to do is change their body composition. They want to grow a little bit more muscle and lose more fat. And they're, even if they're like, I don't want to grow muscle. I just want to change my shape. If you want to change your shape, you want to grow muscle. Um, so most people get into exercise for body comp to change their body composition. Um, so I believe that lifting weights is like superior as far as body compensation goals are concerned. But like, 
I don't believe that anybody should avoid cardio at all. Like, and what are we talking? I don't, I don't think that, and like cardio is not all cardio. It's like, do I think you should be spending 30 miserable minutes on a treadmill or an elliptical? No. But do I think you should be spending 30 awesome minutes outside walking either in the street or on a trail or walking a dog or walking with friends? Yes. Um, and especially for people with like blood pressure and stuff and even weightlifters, there are a lot of like big guys that I'm like, you need to like do a little bit more cardio because you're starting like your, your body can't handle the stress of going upstairs because you're so muscular and like, we need to get that conditioning up. So like truly it is a mixture of both. It just depends on who you are, your time frame, and like your goals. But like, to be honest, like walking is cardio. And like, if the, if the grocery store or the bar meetup or whatever is within three miles of where you live, just walk, like just walk or ride a bicycle. Like it doesn't, people were so deconditioned from that, but like walking is the most natural thing we do. If you walk, your cardio will go up. You'll be more relaxed. And also you'll have better posture because you're used to holding your body upright and moving. So yeah. <laughs> Ride a bike. Ride a bike. I love my bike. They do I've that in Colorado them. a lot. And you get yeah. people wearing these speedos, right? Riding the bike out and freaking rush hour traffic. I don't mind oh, that. Yeah. yeah. The speedos. Oh, I like absolutely refuse to like wear the Lycra. You refuse to make yourself aerodynamic? No, I'm like, listen, I'm like, I'm no Lance Armstrong. I'm literally like, I have a 30 pound backpack. Why do I need Lycra to make me more like aerodynamic? I was like, I'm wearing a flannel and some shorts. Some would say Lance Armstrong was no Lance Armstrong, if you know what I mean. Yeah, but Lance Armstrong was competing against a bunch of Lance Armstrong, so... Exactly. I was like, I'm very controversial. I was like, he shouldn't apologize. Whatever. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, everybody else is doing the exact same thing. It's like, arms race. Yeah. Like That's he shouldn't have terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know there's like a lot deeper stuff, but I remember my first thing, my first impression was like, I can't believe they got an apology out of him. Like maybe just like, you know, he like, yeah, I guess the role model thing, but like, dude, he was, he wasn't doing anything different from what anybody else was doing on that team. So you remember the live strong bracelets back in the early oh, yeah. yellow bracelets. Yeah. So uh, that was some kitschy viral marketing before we even used that term. Wasn't it? That was virtue signaling. So that was our first virtue signal. Wasn't it? <laughs> wow. It was a pilot <laughs> signal. That That's interesting. It's a pilot. It was a pilot beacon of virtue signaling. So yeah, I, yeah. Angry story. You went to, you overcame addiction. You went to the military. Then you went to school for kinesthesiology, right? Yeah. Kinesiology. Kinesi yeah. It's a tough word. I love it. It's no, it's great. Like kinesthetics like movement yeah. of the body. It's very, it's very cool. Kino. Yeah. Very, very neat. And then now you've gained a ton of experience helping people eat and work out better. Yes. Very I awesome have. stuff. Yeah, I, I never cease to be amazed by how impressive Twitter is to connect people who are passionate for their respective fields. It's it's wonderful to to see that. You yeah. and I are really big on on working out, and I think it's helpful to have a. And there are a lot more now female voices in, on that front who know those bodies a, a bit better, let's say, than than men do. So not mm -hmm. not talking crap about the the bros at all. Especially no. age, because he, you know, dancing is yeah. its own thing. I think that's a real, a real claim there. Gracefulness and movement. So you and he have that in common. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also, oh yeah. And I wanted to like, for your listeners too, um, I really want to like, I like my mission is to get 1 million women weightlifting and like treating like cooking and weightlifting. But I also like, like the submission of that is to get more women studied in sports science because okay. like, Strength adaptations is a hormonal response to stress. And like women, because we have different hormonal cycles, we absolutely need to be approaching weightlifting differently. Not everybody needs to deadlift. Everybody needs to eat whole fruits and vegetables. Everybody needs to lift weights. But the way that we approach it, like our strength cycling and how we do it, we can, you, can train, uh, you can train much more effectively if you sync it with your menstrual cycle. 
And like, if you sync it with like how you're ovulating and how you're just going through, yeah, going through your menstrual cycle. And I found that that has been so super helpful for women to program adherence and also just strength gains and goal um, achievement. And like anybody, so any of these women who are listening that are curious about weightlifting, I would really encourage you go to ingrypaulineathletics.com. I've got a blog there. I've got a, it's a beginning weightlifting 101 and number six is called menstruation and muscle. And it talks about how you should program your training to your menstrual cycle and how much better that will be for yourself and for your program adherence and also for your energy levels. It's very important. And that is like a huge message that I, message that I want to get out there to our female weightlifters. I will add that to the podcast description and the YouTube video description, because I am very glad to hear that. I think and see, the fact that you're mentioning this, I rarely ever hear anyone talk about women's unique physical cycles in terms of exercise. Don't hear that. Well, obviously, because yeah. I'm a man, but also, I, don't I, mean, talk about it. I hear other things about women's needs and things like that. I hear things about periods. So it's like, why not that too? Why not some proactive stuff that really helps to attune your exercise to the body? I guarantee there are tons of women who don't know that. Like there are tons of women who don't know about proper bra size stuff and are wearing the wrong bra size. When I heard that, yeah. it was fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's and random, but it's like commercials. It's like 80% of women. I don't know what the, what the statistic is. I'm not going to butcher that. Aren't even wearing the right undergarment. Bra. Yeah, of course. All, yeah. Boobs, all, all boobs are different. Yeah. But it is like, I actually, um, I make it a point and it's kind of embarrassing like because I make it a point to talk about my own period and when I'm training and how I'm feeling about it on Twitter and like and it's not like I'm doing it on purpose because yes. like I want to make sure I want to I want women to know that it matters and even if you like because if like it totally matters and the idea that it doesn't matter is absolutely ridiculous and it doesn't make you weaker and it doesn't make you like less it's not like, oh, you're, and it, like my message isn't, oh, you're in your period, you should just stay home. That's not it at all. In fact, hormonally, we are the best adapted to make strength gains when you're actually menstruating on, our, like when you're actually menstruating. So it's like, so it's like, I want to make sure that like, I'm talking about my period and I'm like open it. And even at the gym that I, that I work at, like, I'm like, make sure that I mentioned to the trainer, I was like, yeah, well, you know, I'm just about to get my period. So I'm just not like blah, 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 blah. And I make sure other women hear me talk about it because I want to take away the taboo. Like, dude, half of the, half of the people in this whole wide world have either had a period or on their period or are getting a period. Like, I don't understand why it's You've so heard it here, folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, so women should, be talking about it and women should be able to communicate with their trainers like what's happening in their menstrual cycle and trainers should educate themselves in how to deal with a woman and her menstrual cycle and i mean we have just so many other cycles like menopause and postpartum and, and i like i absolutely specialize in stuff like that but first and foremost women need to know how to make their cycle that their cycle matters that they should honor it and they should make it work for them because it's a it's an incredibly useful tool so I think hearing about it as an incredibly useful tool is going to be uh, very validating for the women who, let's just say they wouldn't describe their, their period as that. <laughs> it's, I know, it's and it's a shame. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, lots of complications. There. I hear a lot about this stuff, and I'm, it's not awkward to hear about because as a therapist, it's always an honor when, when female clients open up about physical ailment stuff too and aren't, aren't in, inhibited from it, especially as a male therapist. So. I mean, oh, that's good. Nobody talks about it. It's not going to be addressed. And for for the women listeners out there, talk to someone who's really, really versed in this stuff. Got got one right here on my podcast. Mm -hmm. um, talk to your doctor. Talk to people who are in your treatment team. Don't be afraid to, because that's a perfect reframe, Ingrid. You know, half the people are dealing with it. So how half the earth population, I mean, yeah. but for God's <laughs> sake, let's not tiptoe around it. Talk about it with people that you're comfortable with who are, who yeah. are specializing in it. another woman, someone who makes it their, their life's mission, anything like that. So that is a great thing to end on. I think if you yeah. have anything else you want to share about nutrition stuff, cause I want, I really want people to talk to you about it and to direct traffic there because it seems like, I mean, this is, doesn't seem like this is your, life's purpose and you have a lot to share yeah uh <laughs> eat your meat eat your veggies and definitely your fermented vegetables <laughs> organs don't forget organs. organs eat bones and organs yeah 
What yeah. besides the liver do people eat for organ meat? Um, people eat like the intestinal, like the actual intestine. Do you know about I'm haggis? Out, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not out. Maybe I'm out. I don't. Yeah, haggis. Yeah, I'm, you know about haggis, right? Of course, I know about haggis. Yeah, there we go. So for the listeners who don't know, it's the Scottish meat. It's like a what? It's like a sheep's stomach that's just packed with like intestine and liver and like it's basically the innards and they boil it and cook it and serve it and um it's what peasants ate but um uh now with all of our studies we know that it's probably insanely nutrition nutrient dense you have to work the field so i mean yeah you gotta yeah. be ready i can't i'm sorry i'm gonna have to like do a video where i film myself trying it for the first time i've never eaten it I've taken. I know. haven't either, but I'm going back to the Highland Games this year, and I'm going to go eat some gosh darn haggis. You need to tape that. You need. I mean, you need to tape. You need to film that. Put it on Instagram. Put it on Twitter. Put it everywhere. Yes, Ooh. sir. Yes, sir. I will. Yeah. I don't have like, smell vision for that. Oh God. Yeah. Apparently, people will say it's really, really awful. But like, I remember people That's said the awesome. same thing about liver, and I tried it. Yeah, I tried it, and I was like, actually, this is pretty good. I don't you know. Like Doug, that cartoon on Nickelodeon, where it was like he yeah. was afraid of eating livers and uh, liver and onions. Like that's something all kids fear. I never even got faced. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, but I was like, all of the kids' television in the eighties was telling, in the eighties and nineties was telling me that like liver was disgusting, and I was like, now I'm like, oh, it's so delicious. <laughs> oh yeah, liver. Yeah, wonderful. You know, my own nutritional overhaul after listening to this. That yeah. Well, Highland get. What about again, tripe? Go ahead. What were you gonna say? Deep nutrition. Deep nutrition. Nutrition. I would put that. If, you're, if I haven't convinced you, this actual MD might <laughs> who you, wrote a book about it. So no, uh, talk to me about tripe. What about sheep guts? I mean, it's the same thing, right? It's like yeah. all the organs. Like, it's, mean, all the, like it's all the... I think it's like the whole buffet in the stomach bag. I think yeah, in the stomach bag. I know. It's not... It's a little tough to swallow, but I'm bumped. Um, yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. This has turned into like morning show discussion over here. Yeah, yeah. You are very charismatic and a wonderful interview, Jeremy. I've really enjoyed being on this podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I'm leaving that in, and I'm going to have that as the sound bite and bumper thing when I start compiling like my digital sound clips of praise from guests, like how you know something in the morning, and you have a bunch yeah. of boom, boom, boom clips. It's like. Yeah, yeah. Balance between shock radio and actual stuff that you can take away, actual implementable, applicable advice. That's a good yeah. place to Dictators, have menstruations, and bad puns. Woo, all here. I should really <laughs> say that is the kind of description there. Wow. Okay. On that note, I'm recording. Thank you so much for being on. You rock, Ingrid. Keep doing uh, your, your, your best stuff. You're, you're really helping the women out there with exercise stuff. Living your thank best you. life. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you again for having me on. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. You got it.